Hello trigonometry students, my name is Jamie Amy and this video starts our discussion for chapter 5 on trigonometric identities. So we're going to start with the fundamental identities. First off we have the reciprocal identities. You guys have already learned that cotangent and tangent are reciprocal functions. Here it is written as an identity. You could also write it as tangent of theta is equal to 1 over cotangent, if you'd like. It's an equivalent form. Um, one other way to write secant theta being equivalent to 1 over cosine theta, same thing. You can look at cosine theta being uh, 1 over secant theta. So that is an identity right there, reciprocal identity. And third one, uh, cosecant theta is equivalent to 1 over sine theta, equivalent form sine theta is equivalent to 1 over cosecant theta. Quotient identities. We know that tangent, well, let me put this one in terms of x, y, and r first. We know that um, sine is, I'll just write it right here. We know that sine is y over r when we're talking in terms of x, y, and r. We know that cosine is x over r, and if we look at the quotient of these two, so divide it there, the r's cancel, and we have y over x. And that is where this quotient identity comes from, that tangent theta is equivalent to sine theta over cosine theta. Similarly, cotangent of theta is equal to cosine theta over sine theta just writing that in terms of x, y, and r so you can see it, would look like that. Uh, you could also note that tangent and cotangent are reciprocal identities, so notice here how tangent is y over x and cotangent is x over y. Next identities to look at, and these are all the fundamental identities, okay? You're gonna, you want to know these by heart. No matter what you study in math, when these come up, you want to be able to quickly um, recall them. Pythagorean identities, uh, this comes, we saw this on the development of the unit circle uh, to discover stuff about our trig functions. Sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. Let's see, some equivalent forms that might be helpful to us. Uh, if we solve this one right here for sine, it would look like, let's see, sine of theta would be equal to, if we move the cosine squared theta to the other side, we'd have to do so using subtraction. And then if we got rid of the squared, uh, we would do so using uh, the square root. So sine of theta would be equal to plus or minus the square root of one minus cosine squared theta. Uh, using this again, but if we want to solve for cosine, it would look very similar. To isolate cosine, we would have to move sine squared theta to the other side using subtraction and get rid of the squared using a square root. So to do introducing a square root means we have to address the positive and the negative root of 1 minus sine squared theta. So these are all the same thing. They're all the same identity. I would have this one right here memorized, sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. And then if I was asked or needed to use uh, one of these equivalent forms, I would be able to just quickly develop it the way that we just did by solving for sine or solving for cosine. Uh, Pythagorean identity here, tangent squared theta plus one equals secant squared theta. Should you, so this one's solved for secant squared theta right now. Should you want to solve this for um, secant of theta, you would just need to get rid of the squared. So you could do that by square rooting both sides. I'm gonna switch the order just so it looks like secant theta equals. So we would need um, the plus or the minus, positive or negative root of tangent squared theta plus one. Uh, let's see, if we want to solve this one for tangent, we would need to move the plus one to the other side using subtraction 
and square both sides to get rid of that. I'm sorry, square root both sides to get rid of the squared right here. Make sure to address the positive and the negative root. That would be secant squared theta minus one. Again, all three of these are just equivalent forms for the Pythagorean identity, tangent squared theta plus one equals secant squared theta. And again, I would have this one here memorized and if I was requested to solve this for secant, tangent, or if I, if it was in my benefit to solve this for secant or tangent, I would do so uh, just like we did there. All right, third Pythagorean identity, one plus cotangent squared theta equals cosecant squared theta. So we could square root both sides if we wanted to look at cosecant in terms of cotangent. And um, similarly, if we wanted to look at cotangent in terms of cosecant, we would uh, solve for cotangent by moving the one to the other side using subtraction and square rooting both sides, making sure to address the positive and the negative roots, minus one. All right. Next identities are the even and odd identities. And we talked about um, all of these when we were graphing the functions. We were looking at it, uh, using it more for symmetric purposes, like cosine, for example, is an even function. And that is because if we did one period of cosine there and another one right here, and then we took this graph and we folded it along this vertical axis, every point on the positive side of the x-axis would match up to every point on the uh, negative side of the x-axis. So that's how we first saw the introduction of even identities. And then here it is in um, an identity form. Cosine of negative theta is equivalent to cosine of positive theta. And that is because if we took theta, let's say we go with um, theta equals pi. So if we go over here to positive pi, our graph has a value, the height of it right here, of negative one. And the same thing happens if we go on the other side, over here to negative pi. Cosine has a value of negative one. That's what makes it even, looking at it as an identity. Secant is also even. Odd identities, those um, graphs of those periodic functions are not symmetric about the vertical or y-axis. They are symmetric about the origin, um, but that is defined as an odd function. So if we were to fold this along the y-axis, um, they would not match up. For example, if we go over to, let's make Let's go to theta equals pi over two. So for sine, we go right here to pi over two. See how the graph of sine is above? It has a value of positive one. Whereas if we go over here to negative pi over two, this is gonna get really cluttered, sorry. Over two, then our graph has a value, it's down here, it's at negative one. So see how they're opposites. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's just information. If we go to this theta, we have a value of one. It's corresponding negative, we have a value of negative one. And that's always gonna be the case. So the odd identities are sine of a negative theta will be equal to negative sine that theta because these are gonna have opposite signs. So to make this equivalent, we have to put the negative here. All right, let's practice working with these even and odd identity example. Let's go there first. A, if cosine of theta is equal to positive 0.5, then cosine of negative theta is also equal to positive 0.5. Cosine is, why is that? That's because cosine is an even function. Let's see another one. If cosine of theta is equal to negative 0.5, then cosine of negative theta is also equal to negative 0.5. Notice here, 
in part A, the answers are both positive. And they're both positive because, you know what, I should say that slightly different. They're the same, they have the same sign because cosine is even. Here, our values are negative half and negative half. And they have the same sign because cosine is even. All right, let's check out an odd one using sine. If sine of theta equals positive 0.5, then sine of negative theta would be negative 0.5. Notice here that they have different signs, and that is because sine is odd. Looking at part D, if sine of theta equals negative 0.5, then sine of negative theta would be positive 0.5. So I just want you to see that it's about the signs being the same for even or opposite for odd negative, positive. All right, let's check out some reciprocal identity um, examples. A, if cosine of theta equals negative 3 over 4, then its reciprocal function, secant, of theta would be equal to, and it would be the reciprocal of negative 3 fourths, which is negative 4 thirds. B, if sine of theta is equivalent to 0.25, then its reciprocal function, cosecant of theta, would be equal to the reciprocal of that value, which is 1 over 0 0.25, which is equivalent to 4. That's uh, just some examples on using reciprocal identity. Quotient identity. If cosine of theta equals 0 0.8 and sine of theta equals 0 0.3, then tangent of theta, using the quotient identity, would be sine its value divided by cosine's value. So 0 0.3 divided by 0 0.8, which is 0 0.375. <laughs> and we can also find cotangent uh, using the quotient identity. Cotangent, uh, cotangent of theta is equivalent to cosine divided by sine. So cosine's value being 0 0.8, sine's value being 0 0.3, then cotangent of theta would be approximately 0 0.267. I had to round that one, so I'm saying approximately. If you are rounding, uh, make sure you use the number of decimal places requested. Pythagorean identity example. If sine of theta is equal to 0 0.25, then using the uh, Pythagorean identity, 0 0.25 squared plus cosine squared theta is equivalent to 1. What we've done here is given ourselves an equation with only one unknown in it, that being cosine of theta. So we can manipulate this equation to isolate cosine theta, and by just knowing sine theta's value, that leads us to cosine theta's value. To do so, you'll want to subtract the 0 0.25 from uh, squared from both sides of the equal sign, square root both sides of the equal sign, and it turns out that if sine has a value equal to 0 0.25, then cosine's value is approximately positive 0 0.967, or it could be negative 0 0.967. It's gonna depend on which quadrant we're in. So cosine of theta would be equal to positive 0 0.967 if the terminal side of theta was in quadrants one or four. <coughs> and cosine of theta would be approximately the negative 0 0.967 if the terminal side of theta lies in quadrant two or quadrant three. Example, if tangent of theta is equal to negative five over three and theta is in quadrant two. Okay, so this one's giving us some more information to help us decide. So I have a feeling we're gonna get down to a plus or minus something. Uh, find each function value. All right, so the first one it wants us to find is secant of theta. Okay, given tangent, find secant. Here's what I want you guys to do in that um, situation. If you're ever given tangent and you're trying to find secant, I'm gonna erase all these equivalent forms. Let's see, erase pen. <clears throat> okay, the first thing we have to do, given tangent, 
find secant. We need to find, we need to choose one of these identities. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We've got 14 to choose from right now. So we're working with the fundamental identities. 14 fundamental identities to choose from. We need to pick one that has tangent, because that's what we're given, and has secant. It has to have secant, because that's what we're looking for. And ideally, wouldn't have anything else. Okay? This is what we're given. This is what we're being asked to find. So you got to strategize. Lots of derived proven um, formulas for us to use, but we have to be strategic about the one we select. So look through and try to find one that it must have secant, that's what we need to solve for. And ideally, it would just have tangent and no other um, unknowns in it. Let's go ahead, look through, and think about which one you would choose. All right, hopefully you went with this one right here. We can see that it has secant, so we'll be able to solve for that. And it is only dependent on tangent. So this one is perfect. If you went with a different one, it may not necessarily be a wrong choice, but it may cause yourself extra steps. Like if you use, for example, if you chose this one right here, that's gonna, oh, actually, no, that won't help very much at all because we don't we don't have cosine and we don't have secant yet. Let's say let's say you went with um, this one. Let's say you went with this one. So you have tangent of theta equals, and you somehow used that information if you even had enough information to find sine and cosine. Then once you find sine and cosine, then you did more work to try and find secant. Which uh, oh, then you could go to that one right there. So maybe you could go from here to here, and that'll get you from the given tangent all the way to what you need to find, which is secant. But we wanna be better with our strategies. Um, our strategy, like I said, pick one. It must have secant. Ideally, it only has tangent. Other than that, other than secant, and this right here would strategically be the most efficient identity to choose. Okay, that was a lot of thought process and a lot of work before we even get to start our solution here. You have you want to put yourself through that process, that thought process that we just went through so that you can know how to even start your um, solution. So we're gonna use the Pythagorean identity that we selected. From here, we plug in the value of tangent that was given to us. Then we use um, our combined uh, through addition right there. Square root both sides and we are in quadrant two per the given information. So it will be our negative square root of 34 over three. See that strategy there? The work, the, this strategy right here was necessary to get us started. Everything else from there is really just manipulating your equation until you solve for secant. All right, so next we get to, whoops, didn't mean to show that. Now we get to extend the list of what we know. So we were given tangent, but now we also have secant. We found it. So now we have tangent and we have secant and we need to find sine. Go back to your um, slide with your, um, with our fundamental identities. Let me erase all this pen writing this up, we are given tangent, that one they handed to us. We had to do some work to find secant, but now it's given, we know its value. And we are looking to find sine for this part. So when we go through our, our list of identities, we wanna make sure to choose one that has sine. So let's eliminate some just to help us narrow this down a little bit. This one has sign, this one has sign, this one has sign, this one has sign. Okay, so looking at just, just oh, uh, the even and odd won't really 
help us out here because okay so we have one two three four that we can choose as our starting um, point and ideally it would be one of these that has sign check we got that and it only has tangent or secant other than sign let me say that differently it has sign and the only other trigonomic functions it has are tangent and or secant. Well, when we look through sine but cosecant, sine but cotangent and cosine, um, sine but tangent and cosine, sine but cosine, none of them are ideal. None of them, that means by ideal for me at least, that means I choose one, I work with that one identity and I'm done with, I can um, give my answer. None are ideal but we still have to choose one to start with. Then, once we choose one, we can call on any other identity that, we can, that will help us get to the value of sine. For example, if, you start, if we start with this one right here, this is a good choice to start with because it has sine, it has tangent, and it has cosine, which we don't know cosine, but if we use this identity next, any of the ones we crossed out, we, we can use um, after we choose our first initial one, which has sine in it. So we could use this one here to change cosine into one over secant. Now that's ideal right there. Tangent of theta is equal to sine theta over one over secant theta. That's, that's one good plan. Um, another one over here. If you choose to start with this one and you do the same thing, change your cosine in uh, cosine squared theta into one over secant squared theta, that's ideal right there. Okay, so putting yourself through this process is going to be very valuable. Write this up. If you're struggling choosing which one, write it up like this puzzle piece them together. Once you get that your strategy determined, then start to write up your solution, which would look like, I'm going with the quotient identity, so the first strategy that I um, kind of I highlighted. So using the quotient identity, tangent of theta is equal to sine theta over cosine theta. Solving this for sine, multiply both sides by cosine theta. And then we take that cosine theta, use its reciprocal identity, which is one over secant theta. You could have changed, you guys, I did this in this order. You could have done, um, change this immediately to one over secant theta, then multiply both sides by one over secant theta. That's fine. We get to this point right here. Now we are able to plug in our known values one over secant theta is negative radical three over four. Tangent of theta is negative five thirds. This one we found, this one was given. Let's do some arithmetic here to simplify that. And we are in quadrant two, so sine theta will be equal to five over the square root of 34. That's the positive root, because we're in quadrant two. And then the very last step you see here is just rationalizing the denominator. All right, continuing to work with the fundamental identities. This time we're asked to write cosine of x in terms of tangent. So we need to write co cosine in terms of tangent. Okay, so since secant is related to both cosine and tangent by identities, I'm gonna choose to start with the Pythagorean identity one plus tangent squared x equals secant squared x, okay? What that lets me do, if you choose to go with this strategy as well, what that lets us do, we can take the reciprocal of each side of the equal sign, so it looks like this here, and we can take this reciprocal identity and change it into cosine of theta. This is all the same strategy, the same thing we were doing when we were looking at our, our list of identities and we were puzzle piecing them together to get what we're being asked to find in terms of just the other trig function. 
All right, from there we can square root both sides and uh, let's see, rationalize the denominator and our sign would be dependent on our quadrant, which it doesn't say which quadrant, so we are going to keep the positive and the negative roots and there is cosine in terms of tangent. Okay, continuing to work with fundamental identities, write one plus cotangent squared theta over one minus cosecant squared theta in terms of sine and cosine, and then simplify the expression so that it has no quotients. Okay, so we have this expression right here, and we just need to write it in terms of sine and cosine. So we look at our list of identities, we start to puzzle piece them together so that we can get rid of cotangent, get rid of cosecant, replace them with expressions in terms of sine and cosine using identities. Well, cotangent is cosine over sine. That's the quotient identity. So we start with the quotient identity, cotangent changes here, and then this one right here is a reciprocal identity. Cosecant of theta is equal to one over sine of theta. So start with the quotient identity, I should say, right, the quotient identity on the top, and then here, this is the reciprocal identity. Just gonna write ID. Okay, so cotangent is equal to this, quotient identity. Cosecant is equal to this, reciprocal identity. Okay, from there, we just do some simplifying. One thing to do is multiply the numerator and the denominator by the least common denominator. Uh, that's a strategy uh, called clearing the fraction. You may have called, uh, heard it called that before. So our current denominator, our current least common denominator is sine squared theta. So if we multiply the entire thing by sine squared theta, which would, we'd have to multiply the top and the bottom by that, so that it's equivalent to multiplying by one, we can clear that fraction and now our, we're working with sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta over sine squared theta minus one. Okay, you'll, you'll wanna distribute this to see how we got that next line. Take your time, write out extra work in between if you need to, gets us to here. And then, well, I mean, we're technically done, just wanna point that out. The request was to write this in terms of sine and cosine but we always want to write it in the simplest form in terms of sine and cosine. So hopefully we see that this right here, Pythagorean identity is equivalent to one. Using the same Pythagorean identity, let me just do this work on the side here. Using the same Pythagorean identity, cosine squared theta, I'll put the one equals over here. I can, uh, we can manipulate this so that it actually looks like our denominator. We can subtract sine squared theta from both sides. So that would be one minus sine squared theta is equal to cosine squared theta. Mm, little problem that this is an equivalent form, but I need to make it look like this denominator, which I was trying to do, but I wasn't careful. I made mine look like one minus sine squared theta. This is not one minus sine squared theta, and commutative property does not hold across subtraction. So even though this is an equivalent form, it's not one that's gonna help us with this. To make this identity look like that, we would want to subtract one from both sides and subtract cosine squared theta from both sides. So it would end up looking like this sine squared theta minus one equals, subtracting cosine of the other side, negative cosine squared theta. And you guys, this work here that I'm showing you, this is really valuable because if you have at least the fundamental identities committed to memory, so that's this one here, 
then you can always just go off to the side, manipulate them. You don't have to um, memorize all these other ones. Just have the one that you know committed to memory, and then you can just move stuff around using your algebra skills to see if there's anything that you can simplify this to, and it turns out there is. This, we just figured out, is the same as negative cosine squared theta. So our numerator is 1, and our denominator is negative cosine squared theta. And using a reciprocal identity there, that reduces to negative secant squared theta. And um, that might be a little tricky in the directions. So check out the directions one more time. It says, write it in terms of sine and cosine. After you're done with that, then simplify the expression so that it has no quotients. Oh, so when I said we were technically done earlier, I was, I was wrong. We had only done this part in terms of sine theta and cosine theta. After that, it says then simplify the expression so that no quotients appear, which is why after that, um, it was okay to introduce secant back into the uh, problem or into the problem. Well, wow, it's hard to believe that this thing right here is equivalent to <laughs> negative secant squared theta, but it is. That is what we just showed. Verifying trigonometric identities. Hence, if you're asked to verify to uh, a ver to verify an identity, you want to learn the fundamental identities and their equivalent forms. You're going to use those, which we've been practicing. Hint: Try rewriting the more complicated side of the equation, simplifying it to try to make it match the simpler side of the equation. Hint: Express all your trigonomic functions in the equation in terms of sine and cosine and then simplify the results. Factoring and algebraic operations should likely be performed. For example, sine squared x plus 2 sine x plus 1, this is a trinomial and this factors into sine x plus 1 squared. You guys have worked with this before. I'm going to write this, i um, just going to do a little side work so you, that you can see this here. Uh, when you first, when we first learned how to factor trinomials like this, it would have come at us like x squared plus 2x plus 1. And if we were asked to factor that, we would attempt to create two binomials. x taking the first two spots. The next two spots would have to go to values that would multiply to 1 and add to 2. And that would be positive 1 and positive 1. And then we always tried to remember when we're multiplying the same base by itself two times to write it in exponential notation there. So this is how we first, so you probably saw something like this at first, and now I hope you can see it's the same factoring it's just where we have a trig function there. That's all. So if you see something like this that looks like it can be factored, it may be beneficial to um, put things in factored form and to use algebraic operations. Last hint. If the expression contains, let's say, 1 plus sine x, then you'll want to multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate which is 1 minus sine x. That would give us 1 minus sine squared x, which is a part of the Pythagorean identity and equal to cosine squared x. <laughs> Same goes for if our denominator is 1 minus sine x, 1 plus cosine x, and 1 minus cosine x. Let me, let me elaborate a little bit. Let's go with this first one here. Let's pretend this is our denominator, and if we multiply it by the conjugate, like we're told in this hint, why? What's the benefit of that? The benefit of that is when you take a binomial, uh-oh, when we take a binomial and we multiply it by its conjugate, that just means keep your terms the same, but it goes from the sum to the difference. 
if we distribute this, it brings us to a difference of two squares. So that would be one, middle two terms cancel, and the last would be sine squared x. So that would be one minus sine squared x. Okay, so we let's say we had this, we were told to multiply by this, which would give us this. And how does that help us? Because of the Pythagorean identities. Now let's try one. Example, verify that the following equation is an identity. Okay, so we're told that cotangent of theta plus one is equivalent to C, uh, cosecant theta times the quantity cosine theta plus sine theta. Hard to believe when you just look at it like that, that cotangent theta plus one would be equivalent to this, but it is. And that makes it an identity, and we're just being asked to verify it. So just show, using all the skills we've been working with, just and the hints that we were just given, given, just show that cotangent theta plus one can be written like this. All right, first hint was take the more complicated side and try to rewrite it as the less complicated side. So I think this one is the more complicated side. So I'm gonna work with that. Now working with just this, my goal is to make it look like this right here. All right, so I'll use the identities to start manipulating this somehow. I'm thinking rewriting all functions in terms of sine and cosine. That was the second hint. So if I take cosecant, I can rewrite it as one over sine theta. And if I do that, all of my terms will be in terms of sine and cosine. It would look like this. Okay, so we used the first hint. We used the second hint. Keeping our eye on the goal is, uh, is very valuable. The hints and keeping your eye on the goal. Remember the goal, it's to make it look like this. I'll put like a star, this is, this is the goal. Make this thing look like that thing. Okay, so we've used a couple hints so far. Well, if we just use our um, some algebra manipulation here, we could distribute and now we're working with cosine theta over sine theta plus sine theta over sine theta. This looks nice because this goal of cotangent theta plus one is a binomial. We're looking at it as a binomial now, and sure enough, cosine theta over sine theta is equivalent to cotangent theta, and sine theta over sine theta is equivalent to one. So, believe it or not, cotangent theta plus one is equivalent to this. So that is definitely an identity, and we just verified it. All right, next one. Verify that the following equation is an identity. Tangent squared x times quantity one plus cotangent squared x is equal to one over one minus sine squared x. Okay, first hint, let's use it. Let's work with the left side this time because this looks like the more complicated side. Okay, taking it, we've got this here. We're going to, let's try distributing our tangent squared x. Okay, now we're looking at this here. Let's use the second hint, which is to rewrite all functions in terms of um, sine and cosine. Oh, but we're gonna make an edit to the second hint. Um, we've got tangent, tangent, and cotangent. So similar to the second hint where you rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine, if you can write everything in terms of the same trig function, that is very helpful. Watch, cotangent, we've got tangent, tangent, and cotangent. So rewrite cotangent in terms of tangent. Now look, we've got tangent, tangent, and tangent. That helps with reducing, um, combining through operations because we're in like terms. In fact, we could go ahead and do this multiplication uh, right there. That gives us tangent squared theta being equal to tangent squared x, I'm sorry, I said theta, tangent squared x plus tangent squared x times this. These would cancel, and this multiplication 
simplifies to just 1. Now we have tangent squared x plus 1. Okay, sometimes we go, I think I'm done. Like, this looks really good, right? But we have to look at the, um, the goal, which again, it's right here. That's what we want to verify. We want to make that look like this. So we're getting close. If we then change or use the Pythagorean identity, making this secant squared x, then <laughs> we take secant squared x using the reciprocal identity, which is 1 minus cosine squared x, and finally, using the Pythagorean identity, cosine squared x is equivalent to 1 minus sine squared x, we have done it. <laughs> So lots of work there. This, this one was just multiplying. This step here to here was just multiplying. Here to here was a Pythagorean identity. Here to here was a reciprocal identity. Uh, reciprocal. And then here to here was a different Pythagorean identity. It's tricky, but if you're good at puzzles or if you practice with this and become good at this, it's really, it's just a puzzle. You're using all those puzzle pieces to make this puzzle look like that puzzle. And this was, to we were told this is a, an identity. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe those are equivalent, but they are. And what we did just now is called verify it. Okay, last one. Verify that the following equation is an identity. Cosine over 1 minus sine equals 1 minus sine over cosine. Okay, uh, I don't know if our first hint is going to be all that helpful to us this time because, well, which side is more complicated? Mm, I don't know, I think they're pretty equal as far as their amount of complication. So maybe you can just, we can just choose either one, maybe. Um, second hint, writing everything in terms of sine and cosine or all in the same um, trig function, in terms of the same trig function. Well, everything already is in terms of sine and cosine. So I'm trying to recall that list of hints. We've used the first two a couple times. Um, oh, let's look at them. All right. Oh, I said first two, but we've used this one. Um, these are the ones we used. Make use the start with the complicated side. Write everything in terms of sine and cosine, or all in terms of the same trig function. Last two hints: uh, factoring and algebraic operations, or this hint here of multiplying by the conjugate. So if our expression has one plus sine x, one minus sine x, one plus cosine x, or one minus cosine x, I think we're going to use this fourth hint here. Let's see. Solution, both sides look equally complicated. So just pick one. Start with the right side. So I'm starting with this side uh, here. I'm going to, to use the fourth hint, which is to multiply by the conjugate. So taking the numerator right here and multiplying by its conjugate. That's the same binomial with opposite, um, opposite uh, operation. You have to multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate or you've changed the value of your expression. Okay, from here, if we distribute, some people call it FOIL, we end up with a difference of two squares, one minus sine squared x. And for our denominator, instead of distributing, let's leave it in factored form for now, okay? All right, our numerator, the whole um, point of multiplying by the conjugate, for this particular question at least, helped identify a Pythagorean identity, 1 minus sine squared x is equivalent to cosine squared x. All right, this is looking nice. Um, it's a good thing we left this in factor form because this factor and the numerator have something in common, so we can reduce one of the cosines from the top and one of the cosines of the bottom. So now we have cosine over one minus sine x and I on the goal here, that's actually 
what we were aiming for. So we have verified that identity. All right, let's stop now and do some homework. Go to uh, the chapter five homework and please do numbers one through 30. All right, my name is Jamie Amy. Thank you for being here and I will see you all next time.